All right, this is a grindhouse movie that Jim Morrison was working on. It's called The Hitchhiker. Um, so this is the actual script of The Hitchhiker. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but Jim Morrison was writing a script for a grindhouse movie. Um, so here you go. The screen is black. We hear a young man's voice in casual conversation with friends. No, this guy told me you can go down across the border and buy a girl and bring her back. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to buy one of them and bring her back and marry her. I am. An older woman's voice. Billy, are you completely crazy? We hear the good nature laughter of the woman. A woman and another friend, as Billy's insistent voice rises through, saying, No, it's true. Really. This guy told me it's true. I'm really gonna do it. The film changes to color. A couple sit at a small table in a simulated border town nightclub. It is a close shot, reminding us, possibly, of Picasso's absinthe drinkers. The atmosphere is suggested by peripheral sounds such as boisterous young voices, cursing, and foreign language. The tinkling of glasses and music from a small rock band. Perhaps a dancer is visible in the background, perhaps topless. An anonymous waitress could enter the frame and leave serving drinks. The hero is drunk and he's trying to persuade an attractive Mexican girl, a waitress in the bar, a whore, to cross the border and marry him. The girl tolerates him. She is working, hustling drinks, and has to listen, but also she likes him. In some way, he interests her. Billy, I bet the only reason you won't come with me is because I ain't got any money. Well, listen. I'm telling you, I'm going back up there to get me some money, lots of it, maybe even 10000 and then I'm coming back for you, I'm coming back. He, he weaves off screen, determined, drunk, camera holds on the girl, smiling wistfully and ironically after him. Then she grabs another American and pulls him down beside her, the girl, hey man, you want to buy me a drink? Title, The Hitchhiker, an American Pastoral. Film changes to black and white. It is drawn, it is dawn on the American desert. It's cold and he stands hunched in his jacket by the side of the highway. The sun is rising. We hold on him as a few cars go by at long intervals. We hear the car coming, watch his eyes watching, he sticks his thumb out. Cut to, profile shot. As a car swishes by, the third car stops and he runs, not too energetically, and gets inside. Interior car. Middle-aged man in a business suit, he asks the hitchhiker where he is going. Billy mumbling, L.A. He is obviously reluctant, reluctant to do any talking, the driver. I could take you as far as Armarilla, and then you'll have to go on from there. Billy, no reply, no recognition. Driver. What are you to do when you get to L.A.? Have you got a job lined up? Billy, no answer. He is beginning to nod. The man drives on. We see glimpses of the American landscape out the window of the car. The man glances sideways occasionally at Billy, who is sleeping. Close up of the man's right hand moving stake-like towards the hiker's left leg. He hesitates and then touches it above the knee. Immediately, a 38 revolver appears from Billy Jacket's, Billy's jacket and points at the driver. Pull over, says Billy. Profile of, 
Profile of car, left side, extremely long shot. We hear a shot. The hitchhiker comes around the rear of the car, opens the door, and pulls the driver towards the camera, his corpse, that is, to the goalie. And after stripping his wallet of all, his, all the cash, gets into the car and drives away. The kid is standing beside the car with his thumb out. The hood is raised. The engine has failed. State patrolman, we learn this from his uniform, western hat, and badge, stops in his own unmarked car. Billy gets in the car. The sheriff is friendly. He talks a lot. He tells Billy that he's just getting back home after de delivering two lunatics from his local jail to the state asylum. Sheriff, I had to put them both in straitjackets and throw them in the back of the wagon. I had to. They were totally uninhibited. I mean, if I let them loose, they just start jerking off and playing with each other. So I had to keep them tied up. The killer is trying to stay awake. He's strung out on Benny's and also just plain exhausted. And he's fighting to follow the man's conversation. The sheriff rambles on. Billy is in that weird state between sleep and waking up where it's hard to distinguish between what's being said in reality and what he hears in his dream. The sheriff asks a question. He answers and then jerks up suddenly to realize that he's being inventing his own dialogue inside his head. Finally, he can take it no longer. He pulls the gun out and orders the sheriff to pull over on the side of the road. Then he forces him to unlock the trunk, orders him inside and slams the lid interior of car the hitchhiker is driving on as the car slows down for an upgrade the trunk flies open and the sheriff tumbles out into the dust billy sees it in the rear view mirror he slams on the brakes jumps out from the car and runs back to the spot from off in the desert we see the sheriff racing insanely toward the camera he suddenly leaps and throws himself flat on the ground beside a sand dune next to the camera. From this point of view, the sheriff crouched and breathing in heavy gasp. We watch the kid stand on the side of the road, stare out into the desert, and finally get back into the car and drive away. Billy is hitchhiking again, obviously. He has ditched the sheriff's car somewhere along the way. A car pulls over. There's a young man driving, and in the back seat are his wife and two small children, a boy and a girl. The driver is friendly, tells him he used to hitchhike a lot himself, and volunteers the information that he has just returned home from two years in Vietnam, where he was a pilot. Billy pulls out his gun and lets them know immediately that he wants them to take him anywhere he wants to go. Otherwise, he will kill them. It is night. They pull into a gas station. Billy is hungry. So are the kids. So he goes with his ex-aviator into a small country store that's part of the station. He warns the family to keep quiet or he'll kill everyone. Inside the country store, a seedy old man behind the counter. They ask him for a bunch of ham sandwiches. In close-up, we watch him slice the meat, the knife hesitating minutely, deciding on the thickness of each slice. The two, the two men standing there watching him. Suddenly the husband wheels around and gets the grip of the hitchhiker from behind. They whirl madly around the store, the father screaming for the proprietor to call the police. The man. Stop him! He's got a gun! He's gonna kill us! Help me! Billy somehow manages to get the gun out and forces the man to the car. The store owner stares after them. Mouth agape, then picks up the receiver to call the police. Morning. A young boy finds the car, pulled off on the side of a road, splattered with blood. He opens the door and sees the little girl's baby doll, the naked flesh color rubber kind, and in close-up, we see blood on it.
the exterior of a rundown shack in the country. We hear the sounds from inside, interior of shack. Television and radio and newspaper reporters, including an attractive woman with a notebook, are interviewing the killer's father. He's a very old man, an alcoholic, who is slightly pleased to be thrust suddenly into the spotlight. But who treats the situation with a grave sense of public image and self-irony? The father. He was always a pretty strange boy, especially after his mother passed away. Then he got real quiet. He didn't have many friends, just his brothers and sisters. Girl reporter. Mr. Kook, is there anything you'd like to tell your son? Father. Yes, there is. Billy, if you can hear me, son, please turn yourself in. Because what you're doing, it just ain't right. You're not doing it right, son. And you know it. During this appeal, the camera has moved, has moved slowly into a close-up of the old man's face. Interior. Car. Night. Rain. A car radio. The light glows yellow in the dark car. The radio is playing a country gospel hour. A revival meeting. The preacher and his flock. As Billy listens, we flash into his past. Over the rain and windshield wipers. We see an old man and a young boy in the woods. The man is Billy's father. And the boy is Billy himself. At about age seven or eight. The father teaches his hunt son how to shoot a gun. He tells him to aim it at a rabbit. The father. Don't be afraid, son. Don't be afraid. Just squeeze one off. We see a rabbit pinioned in a rifle's telescopic sight. A small town school, 330, bell rings. School is out. <clears throat> the kids gush from the building and flow like a human stream to the favorite stream in restaurant. Interior of car. Billy is eating at a eating a cheeseburger and coke through his windows. He watches his movement of one of the car hops. She's wearing slacks, and with him, we watch her ass and thighs. When she comes to collect, he asks her to come for a ride with him. We hear him say this, but the ensuing dialogue is shown in pantomime. The actual voices are drowned out by the sounds of radios and kids talking. They are driving up a mountain road. The Rolling Stones, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, comes on the radio. Billy sings along with the record with wild and abandon and squirms in a seat like a toad. The car is parked on a rocky view overlooking the ocean. He gets out of the car and he dances around it, acting crazy and howling like an Indian. He ducks up and down, appearing and reappearing in different windows. She laughs at his clowning. The couple are in the back seat. Vaguely, we see their movements. Hear them whispering, laughing, talking. Cut to outside of the car. They get out of the back of the car, hair and clothes disarrayed, and moving around uh, side by side into a rough terrain behind some rocks. Camera holds on the rocks, a primeval rock formation, at a rhythm that is particularly excruciating. We hear three gunshots, a restroom in an L.A. service station, exterior, Billy enters restroom, interior, restroom, Billy shaves with soap in, in restroom mirror runs his wet hands through his hair exterior downtown la camera follows him from a car as he wanders through the downtown crowds of broadway and main street many times he is lost to our view we see him in an arcade where he plays a pinball machine close up of pinball machine game in process billy in photo booth flash of lights close up of four automatic photos flash 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 
or faces of Billy. Billy in downtown hamburger stand. He is eating. Seen from behind. Gun enters frame. He turns and sees it, stares back blankly. Cut to exterior. Street. In handheld, confused close-up sequence, we see him dragged and shoved into the back seat of a car, a police car. He is kicked and beaten. During the struggle, we hear many men's voices gloating righteously, righteous exclamations, men. So you're the little bastard that killed all those people. Kick. You had a good time, didn't you? Kick. You really killed them, didn't you? Kick. Hands cuffed behind his back, he looks up with a confused expression and says, Billy says, but I'm a good boy. The men laugh. Film switches to color. Montage of extant photographs representing death. The body of Che Guevara. A northern resistance Dutch crucifixion. Bullfight. A slaughterhouse. Mandalas. And into abstraction. A nature film of a mongoose killing a cobra. A black dog runs free on the beach. Fade into blackness. Exterior. Night. On the steps of the City Hall of Justice, we see the hitchhiker descend dreamlike in slow motion. Move languorously across a deserted city square towards the camera until the cover... Until he covers the lens and seems to pass through it. Seen now from behind... As he moves away from the lens, he enters a desert outskirt region where he finds an automobile graveyard. He is wandering into eternity, wandering in eternity. In the junkyard, three people squat around a small fire. They're cooking potatoes in the coals. An older man named Doc pokes the fire with a stick. There is an older woman, funky, glamorous. In the third person is a young boy, a mute, of inter, intermediate, a, a de, indeterminate age, sorry. He is slightly made up with white makeup. They are hobos in eternity and are not surprised to see him. He nears the fire. Doc. Well, how you doing, kid? I see you did it again. You hungry? There's some food here if you want. Billy doesn't speak. He stares at the moon. The woman has kept her head down, her hair covering her face. Doc. Billy's back. Blue lady. Did you hear me? I said Billy's back. She looks up for the first time. Hi, Billy. Hello, blue lady, says Billy. He looks at the boy. Hi, you clown boy. Clown boy claps his hands and nods, his face contorted grotesquely in meeting. They sit for a while like this and stare at the fire. They eat the potatoes. Then Doc rises and says, Sun's gonna be up in a while. I guess we'd better move on. Slowly, one by one, the other two rise. Doc puts out the fire with dirt and says, you coming with us, Billy? Billy, thinking hard. I don't know, Doc. I just don't know. Doc smiles. Well, we'll see you later, kid. The rest of the gang will be here glad to see you. They sure will. Well, Doc Clown Boy and the Blue Lady start moving toward the sun, rising sun into the mountain desert. Every now and then they turn and wave, Clown Boy leaping up and down madly and waving goodbye. As they slowly disappear, camera changes focus to Billy, the hitchhiker, the kid, the killer, hunkered over the dead, smoldering fire. That ends.